Thank you for so much for coming. Everybody can hear me? Seems louder than it used to be in here. Um, th again, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Michael Osconis. Uh, today we're going to be talking about hydrocolloids. And we'll, we're going to do a deep dive, obviously, but we're going to uh, kind of define what that means. So things we're going to talk about today are all kinds of both animal and plant-based thickeners and gelling agents, not only to kind of explore their use in novel applications, but also uh, things that we're very well familiar with. And kind of along the way, maybe showing what I like to call some greatest hits of sort of uh, modernist cooking or what some people for a while called molecular gastronomy. And along the way too, we'll also, where relevant, we'll talk just generally about uh, something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, which is trying to be a better cook through understanding the composition and function of the ingredients that we use. Um, and to me, this kind of helps us on three levels. A, it helps us, um, just make better stuff, uh, which is hopefully always the goal. We're always hopefully refining our, our techniques and refining um, the things that we make. Second, uh, troubleshooting. You know, and this would happen to me all the time working in restaurant kitchens. I would show up and cooks who were there, you know, who started at an earlier shift, something went wrong. And they said, chef, what happened? I don't, I don't know what, this didn't work out. Why not? And I didn't always know because I wasn't standing behind them as they were making it. Um, but certainly if I understand how ingredients work in a recipe and how they all contribute to the end results, um, hopefully that can help me solve problems when they arise. And then thirdly, understanding how our ingredients work and what they're made up of um, can lead to creativity. You know, so I, I, sometimes I don't think Creativity in cooking is like being a painter or a musician where you're walking down the street and you're, you're struck by some divine inspiration. To me, creativity in cooking is a lot of deliberate hard work and maybe understanding the properties of this and applying it to this and seeing what happens. And really you can only do that if you kind of understand again, some of the underlying science of cooking. So they're all, all, all kinds of aspects of, of science that we can apply to cooking. I have to kind of walk a little bit closer to my laptop to actually read it. Um, one interesting idea is, um, again, just, just that basic idea of composition and structure and function. Um, there's a whole branch of science uh, called material science. Uh, if you ever hear me talk about uh, ice cream, we're not gonna talk about that too much today, although it is relevant. Uh, we'll be talking about colligative properties, and that's where solids dissolved in water uh, lower the freezing point. And on the other side of the spectrum, solids dissolved in water raise the boiling point. So actually kind of relevant to some of the confections we're gonna look at today. Crystallization is something I talk about a lot when I talk about chocolate. Um, that's something that a branch of science that really helps uh, cooks. Process engineering is simply how we bring ingredients together, the equipment we use. Microbiology is, of course, very important. It can give us 
very good things, but also very bad things, good bacteria and bad bacteria. One of the things we're gonna kind of dive deeper into today is this idea of colloidal chemistry and microstructure and basically changing the physical properties of mostly liquid. Rheological properties is something we're gonna talk about. Rheology is the physics of how liquids flow, very relevant to uh, thickeners and gelling agents. And then finally, sensory science is something we should be doing all the time in the kitchen. Every time we cook, we should be tasting, right? So that's a whole interesting branch of science. So as a cook, I'm thinking about how I can learn from all these branches of science just to make better food. That's my goal every day at least. So things we're gonna be looking at today, we're gonna to be looking at gelatin, probably the most widely used gelling agent in the kitchen. We'll be looking at pectins, pectins plural, uh, agar, probably one of the most easiest to use uh, thickeners and gelling agents, xanthan gum. We'll be looking at alginate to kind of create sort of uh, an interesting science experiment that you can eat, uh, carrageenan, and then finishing up with a, um, an interesting hydrocolloid called methyl cellulose. So let's take a step back and think about really what we're, what we're doing when we're working with thickeners and gelling agents. We're really trying to change the nature of water. Also as a cook, I'm thinking about water a lot because most of our ingredients are mostly made up of water. We are mostly made up of water. So really cooking is a lot of controlling water. We're trying to hold on to it by keeping something moist. We're trying to get rid of it, drying something out. And sometimes we're trying to change its, um, its nature. We're trying to freeze it. We're trying to turn it into steam. We're trying to take water and make it solid to some degree. So that's a lot about what we're gonna be talking about. There is a deeper, more technical definition to the word hydrocolloid, but I like to keep it simple. Split the word into two pieces. Hydro obviously means water. And we can think of colloid. Colloid is actually technically a dispersal of two different substances, but what hydrocolloids basically do is they give structure to water. Why do we care? Why, why do we wanna use these things? Um, sometimes to make new and novel things, uh, but really hydrocolloids are all around us all the time. Certainly gelatin and pectins, thing we use a lot in the pastry kitchen as well as the savory kitchen, but hydrocolloids also include starches. Corn starch is a hydrocolloid, flour is a hydrocolloid. When you're making um, a roux for the savory cooks, when you're making a roux with flour, you're taking advantage of the uh, starch in the protein acting as a thickener. Uh, egg yolks act as a thickener. So these hydrocolloids are all around us, but typically when we're talking about hydrocolloids, we're talking about um, white powders, which we have a lot of behind us today. So not only trying to do new things, but then also trying to better understand things that we're already making. You know, so I, I mean, I think of it in the grand scheme of cooking. Modern cooking has evolved. It continues to evolve. It's evolved a lot since I started cooking about 25 years ago. But one of the big things that I think is most important is sure we can do novel techniques and turn things into spheres and turn things into films and interesting things like that. But one of the greatest tools that we have when we're using some of these ingredients, is they're really about preserving flavor. We can get textures that we can't get otherwise. Sometimes we can get textures using certain hydrocolloids that otherwise we would have to rely on things like starch and egg yolks, which will mask flavor. So if we can use things to make our finished products more flavor forward, that's always a good thing. So, I would say a lot of the things we're gonna be talking about sort of came into vogue almost 25 years ago, late 90s, early 2000s. We can point to some famous 
chefs in Europe, notably Spain, who started playing around with some of these ingredients, again, to make new novel things, but then also to make things flavor forward. And um, what I observed in that process was everybody kind of rushed to play with these new ideas. And then some of these things kind of fell out of fashion. But when I started looking and hanging out in other people's kitchens, they're still using these things. They're just not beating you over the head with spherification and things like that. Cooks have learned to use these ingredients and just fold it into their everyday work without anybody really noticing, which I think is an interesting idea. Um, let's dive into gelatin. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about gelatin other than maybe offering some best practices and um, perhaps even clearing up a little bit of misunderstandings or mythology about gelatin. So gelatin will primarily come from one of two sources, either uh, bovine or porcine, cows or pigs. Um, it's not made from like hooves and snouts and all that stuff. It is made from bones and hides of these animals. Gelatin, there's a, uh, a fish gelatin, also known as isinglass. Um, it works a little bit differently, but with a little bit of conversion, uh, fish gelatin can work as well. One that I've never used before, I've never even seen it, but I know it exists, it's very rare. It uh, comes from an avian source, from poultry. Um, this is really the only animal-based gelling agent we're gonna be talking about today, but it's so versatile and so unique that a lot of people are often looking for alternatives to mimic gelatin's properties in plant-based form. And we all know the properties of gelatin. We would call that... Um, long textured, it's elastic, it's chewy, it's kind of bouncy. It's really hard to get those characteristics out of most plant-based thickeners. Um, there are some crafty blends that I've come across that come close, uh, but nothing quite gives you the texture of gelatin and it's a unique melting point. It melts right around body temperature, which is what makes it sort of unique and, and pleasurable to consume when it's used in the right uh, amounts. Uh, what else can we say about gelatin? <clears throat> it's thermoreversible. So that's a, a term that we talk about a lot when we're talking about hydrocolloids. Can it be melted down? Can I make a gelatin gel, melt it down, and then recast it? Thermoreversible? Yes, I can. I can take, in theory, I can take these gummy bears, melt them down, and recast them, and they'd be fine. I might lose a little bit of water in the process, but in theory, it's thermoreversible. Some hydrocolloids we're gonna look at are not thermoreversible. They can't be melted down and recast. I talked about gelatin's uh, melting point right around body temperature. We typically associate gelatin with cold items, uh, but really gelatin will start to set just under room temperature around 60 degrees. It does have some sensitivities. High acid or low pH, meaning the same thing. Uh, alcohol, high salt or sugar content. We're trying to gel a liquid that has some of these characteristics. Uh, we might run into problems. We might have to adjust, add a little bit more gelatin or that gelatin uh, gel will break down over time. Um, another interesting um, sensitivity is to enzymes that break down proteins. Um, and there are several fruits that are known to have this enzyme, pineapple, um, papaya, I believe kiwi, fig even has these enzymes. Typically, if we heat the fruit above 140, 150 degrees Fahrenheit, we deactivate that enzyme and we should have a stable gel um, otherwise. Let's talk about best practices. Most of us are using gelatin sheets. We've all used gelatin sheets, right? 
I think they're in every kitchen in the school. Um, how does gelatin work? We hydrate it in water to soften it. We add it to something hot, it dissolves, and then we wait for it to set. Pretty straightforward, right? Typically when I'm hydrating in water, I like a little bit of ice water. Might not be able to see that there, but I have some ice in there. Even tepid, lukewarm tap water can start to dissolve the gelatin while it's hydrating. So when I'm hydrating gelatin, I always wanna preserve as much of that gelling power as I can. So we have sheet gelatin, but we also have powdered gelatin. When I was a young cook, I don't know where this came from, but there was a, this belief that powdered gelatin was less pure somehow. Um, and, and in theory, whenever you take something and you turn it into a powder, there is some, in theory, some uh, idea that it can be adulterated, but essentially, Powder gelatin is sheet gelatin that's ground into a powder. Uh, pretty straightforward. Working with powder gelatin, the one thing I never want to do is hydrate by putting gelatin in a dish and then pouring water over it. Gelatin immediately begins to swell when it comes into contact with water. So if I had powder sitting in a bowl, poured water on top, the gelatin at the top would instantly swell up and leave a big clump of dry gelatin at the bottom. So the best way to work with powdered gelatin is to, and usually that water is measured, and then we sprinkle it on top of the water to properly hydrate that. Gelatin will generally absorb about four to five times its own weight in water. So often when we're working with sheets, we don't measure the water. We just have a big bowl of water. We put the gelatin in and then we take it out, squeeze out the excess water. We have to be careful there because the warmth from our hands can weaken the strength of the gelatin by dissolving some of it. Often what I prefer to do is drain the gelatin through a sieve and maybe just press out the excess water. Typically working with powder gelatin, we're measuring the water. And often that's calculated to about five times its own weight. You can also do that with sheets. So for a period I was thinking about precision. How can I be more precise, more precise? And it kind of drove my cooks at La Bernadette a little crazy. So I said, like, you can no longer hydrate gelatin in a big bowl of water. You have to measure exactly five times its weight and then hydrate it so there's no, you know, it soaks up all the water. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to have some sort of large flat surface with a lot of surface area for the gelatin to properly hydrate. When I'm doing something super precise, I typically use powdered gelatin more often than not. The gummy candy we're going to look at, if I'm making marshmallows, anything where a little bit of excess water can throw off the, the texture. Um, I almost always use powdered gelatin because I can be very precise with the measurements. Here's an interesting idea. Maybe I'll, I'll take a poll for those of you here. Um, when you're using sheet gelatin, uh, what grade are you using? Gelatin's often done by, uh, labeled by a, a, a number, bloom strength, or a grade that corresponds to a, a precious metal, bronze, silver, gold, there's a platinum. Um, for those of you who use gelatin, what's, what's the grade of sheets that you most often use? Gold. Usually when I do a, a demo and I'm talking about gelatin, especially if I'm in a, another city, Almost everybody will have the exact same answer. Silver is the most common. And it's probably because everybody buys gelatin from the same suppliers in that city. So they only carry one kind, maybe two kinds. So we have gold gelatin. We also have silver. That's what we're gonna find mostly in the, the kitchens here. Um, and there's bronze and like I said, platinum. 
as you can see from the slide here, each of these different grades has a different bloom strength. In bloom strength, the higher that number is, the stronger, gram for gram, the stronger gel that that gelatin will create. And bloom, sometimes we refer to hydrating gelatin as blooming gelatin, and it has nothing to do with that. It's actually named after a guy named Oscar T. Bloom, who invented the machine that measures bloom strength back in the 1920s. The higher the number, the stronger the gelatin. So gold, 200 and above, silver, 160 to 180, bronze, 140. It's kind of in those ballpark figures. You start to think, well, if a recipe calls for two sheets of gelatin, is it gonna be different if I use gold versus silver versus bronze? The answer is no. There's actually very few companies that produce sheet gelatin and they've all kind of gotten together to produce a standard. And the standard that they created is a sheet is a sheet no matter what the grade or bloom strength. So a gold sheet will set a gel just the same as a silver or a bronze for the same amount of liquid. There are some differences, say clarity. Gold gelatin is sort of like the extra virgin olive oil of gelatin. It's extracted first in the process and then they go through subsequent extractions which give you the lower grades, the lower bloom strength. So when you're reading a recipe, it calls for two sheets of gelatin. It doesn't matter what you have on the shelf bronze, silver, or gold, a sheet is a sheet. And when you see here on the chart, each sheet weighs a little bit different. So gold is stronger, but a sheet is less in weight than a silver, than a bronze. The problem is, and this thankfully doesn't happen very often, but sometimes I see chefs write recipes where they'll specify a weight of sheet gelatin, which is great unless you don't specify the grade. So if you just say six grams of gelatin, that could be three sheets of gold or it could be two sheets of bronze. And then you would have two very different results. There is a conversion, very complicated formula to convert gelatin. If you're using say a sheet and you wanna convert it to powder, vice versa, very complicated. I once sat down and did every single possible conversion you can think of, and it's in your handout. So now you have this for life. You're welcome. Um, obviously, gelatin is used all the time to make mousses and creams and confections. We can give them two. Why not? Um, Confections like gummy candy, if we cook a sugar syrup, pour it over gelatin and whip it, we have a marshmallow. How does a marshmallow work? As it's whipping, it's cooling, the gelatin is setting, but we're incorporating air into it as it's thickening, as it's setting, um, which is, gives us the aeration, but also the stability. Any questions about gelatin? Pretty straightforward, right? So we'll move on to something else. We'll talk briefly about pectin. Pectins. I guess one other thing I can say about the, uh, the gummy candy is traditionally, um, going back a, a, a couple hundred years, a candy like this would be formed in what's called a starch mold. So a confectioner would have a big tray filled with cornstarch or another type of starch and whatever shape they wanted their candy to be in, maybe a little fish or a bear or whatever it is, they would have a positive of that shape and they would press it into the starch, then deposit the hot gummy candy syrup into those indentations let it set in the starch and then tumbled out of the starch and all the starch removed. It's very messy to do on a small scale. And in this day and age, we have silicone molds in every size shape you can imagine. So these are done in a, a silicone mold. Next, we'll look at pectin. 
other way. Another very commonly used shelling agent in the kitchen. Um, on the confectionery side, certainly jams and preserves and at higher concentrations, higher cooking temperatures. Then we have pot de fouille, which is something that we're gonna look at. But here we'll talk a little bit about the uh, properties of pectins. The source for pectin is plant-based. Um, typically commercial pectin comes from either apples or citrus peels. Um, although interesting in other areas of my life, um, for instance, in chocolate worlds, there's a lot of um, talk about upcycling the, the pulp that's part of the, the cocoa pod. Um, and if you can extract some of that pulp before fermentation, fermenting the cocoa beans, um, it's a very high pectin content. So people are trying to like upcycle um, and add value to cacao pulp by extracting the pectin. Um, same thing with um, the rind of a passion fruit, uh, which makes up like 50% of the weight of a passion fruit. It'd otherwise be thrown away. There are people in South America and other parts of the world trying to extract pectin from those sources. But that just kind of tells us that pectin is virtually found in every, every single plant to varying degrees, of course, but it is the glue that kind of holds cell walls together. And once extracted, we can then use that as sort of a, a food glue as well. There are generally two types. I mean, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of very specific individualized um, pectins out there, but we can put them in two groups. And I'm not going to get into the chemistry of why they're different, uh, but we'll talk about how they're used differently in different applications. Uh, but we have what's called high methoxyl pectin and low methoxyl pectin. So the one that we're going to use most in the kitchen to make things like jams is what we call a high methoxyl pectin. Um, sometimes it's just referred to as apple pectin. Uh, the one that I prefer to use in most confections is called yellow pectin. I don't know why it's called yellow. Uh, I don't know of any other colors that are used to signify different types of pectin. Um, high methoxyl pectin, how does it work? It sets a gel in very high sugar concentrations. And it also is helpful to have a low pH or high acidity to set a pectin gel, high methoxyl pectin gel. Low methoxyl pectin is a little bit different. It's processed a little bit differently. And low methoxyl pectin will set a gel in the presence of certain minerals, mostly calcium. Um, the one place where you could probably find um, a low methoxyl pectin quite readily is in the supermarket. If you ever see a little blue box of pectin, I think the brand is Pomona's. That's a low methoxyl pectin meant to make low sugar jams and preserves. And often there's enough of these minerals in the fruit that we're cooking, or sometimes we can add supplemental minerals like we're gonna do with um, alginate later uh, to form a gel with low methoxyl pectin. We would also say that the texture here is um, as opposed to gelatin, which is long textured, chewy and elastic, pectins usually create gels that are short textured, but soft. One of the biggest sort of sensitivities, I guess you could say, similar to powdered gelatin, is that it's very prone to clumping. So almost any time we wanna use gelatin, or sorry, pectin, we want to dry blend it with another ingredient, typically sugar when we're making pot de fouille or a jam or a preserve, typically five times its own weight, three to five times its own weight and another dry ingredient. So it disperses. As soon as pectin hits water, like gelatin, it swells up. And if we just pour straight pectin into a liquid, we'll have lumps that we'll never, never be able to remove otherwise. Also, unlike gelatin, Pectin gels are not thermoreversible. I can't take one of my pot de fouille, 
melt it down, and then recast it. What else can we say about pectin? I talked about the high solids and low pH. The other sensitivity, so especially when I'm making pot de fuit, and here, Alex, we can pass these around. I made for you a, a red fruit pot de fuit. It's a blend of uh, blackcurrant, blackberry, wild strawberry, and a little bit of raspberry. When we're cooking a jam or a, a pot de fuit, we have our fruits uh, in our pot. We warm our fruits. We add the pectin, mix with a little bit of sugar first. And that, that's, that's something we commonly do when working with hydrocolloids. We always wanna add the hydrocolloid early in the process so it has access to water in that liquid, whatever it is, in this case, fruit puree, to properly hydrate. If we added all of the sugar and all of the pectin all at once, especially something like pot de fouille, where it's a very high sugar content, that hydrocolloid, the pectin is struggling. It's competing with the sugar for access to water. So for pot de fouille, we mix in the pectin with a little bit of, of sugar at the beginning. We bring it up to a boil. And then we have typically an equal amount by weight of sugar and then a small amount of glucose or corn syrup we're adding to pot de fouille. When people tell me, oh, I was making pot de fouille and it didn't set, what did I do wrong? I hate to first say, did you scale it out properly? Did you cook it to the correct temperature? Assuming those were done correctly, I ask, did you add all of the sugar to the pot at once? And if they say yes, then I know what the problem is. What that will do is it will cause the temperature of that boiling fruit to drop drastically. And pectin, pectins have a range of setting temperatures. So for example, we'll find a pectin that's rapid set, which means it sets at a very high temperature. Then there's a medium set, a slow set, and those are used for all different kinds of applications where that setting time and temperature is important. So if I add all of my sugar to my pot de fouille mixture all at once, the temperature drops, the pectin prematurely sets. And then as I continue stirring it, there's another interesting phenomenon that we'll look at later with some other hydrocolloids. Pectin is shear thinning, meaning once a gel has set or once the pectin has started to set, if you stir it, it'll thin out. And we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more closely later. So those are two big sensitivities that pectin have and often the, the cause of most problems that we encounter. Talked about high methoxyl, low methoxyl pectins. Not only do they set under different conditions, but their textures are a little bit different. You can make a solid pot de fouille like uh, candy with the low methoxyl pectin, but it's gonna be a little bit more firm and brittle compared to um, um, soft and short textured like the uh, high methoxyl. And different um, applications where these um, different setting times might be important. Uh, for example, if I'm making pot de fouille, if I'm casting it in a big block, I can be using a rapid set pot de fouille, it doesn't matter. I'm cooking the, the pot de fouille to my final temperature, I add my acid, I pour it into the frame, I'm done. However, if I'm going to be casting it, say in a silicone mold, which not only gives us different shapes, but it saves us time later, we don't have to cut it. Um, on a cutter. Um, this is gonna take a lot longer to deposit. So if I had a rapid setting pectin halfway through, my, pec my, my pot de fouille would be set and I, and I wouldn't be able to deposit. So here I'd want a medium or a, a slower set. If I were making a jam or a preserve that had lots of solids in it, I would want a rapid set because if I poured my, um, preserves into a jar, 
and it was a slow set, all those solids would settle to the bottom before the gel sets. So often, for example, a rapid set was what you would want for um, a jam that has lots of um, inclusions in it. Also, you tasted that. Um, one thing I like to do with um, a pot de fouille because I, I wrote a thing years ago about how I kind of had a love-hate relationship with pot de fouille. It's probably the one thing that you're going to find the most as a like a pedophore option, a miniardise option in a, a high-end restaurant. Why is that? Because it's so easy to make. It's relatively inexpensive. You can make hundreds of them at a time. Um, they have a long shelf life. Uh, so they're easy to make. But <clears throat> talking about being flavor forward, you know, I, I joke, what do I do for a living? I put sugar in stuff. That's what I do. Um, but I'm very conscious of how much sugar I put into things, not because I'm necessarily trying to be health conscious, but it's again about being flavor forward. Sugar can carry flavor, but it can also obscure flavor. Um, so pot de fouille to me has always been, you know, I love it. It's delicious and it's easy to make, um, but it's pretty much equal parts fruit and sugar. So you don't always get like pure expressions of fruit. So to kind of balance that, because um, then what do we do with, with pot de fouille? We cut it and we roll it in more sugar. Uh, but at least that sugar, I'm acidifying it a little bit, <clears throat> adding about 4%, either citric or sometimes malic acid, which is kind of like green apple tart flavor, uh, to kind of give you a little bit of that sour patch kit effect and kind of balance some of that overall sweetness. So that's mentioned in the recipe that you have there as well. Next, let's move on to agar. By show of hands, how many of us have ever worked with agar before? Okay. Probably in use much longer than say gelatin. It's derived from seaweed been in use in uh, Asian cultures for centuries. Kind of to go back to gelatin for a minute, until there was commercial gelatin, you know, in sheet and powdered form that we would buy it at, at the grocery store. Um, if I wanted to make a dessert that included gelatin, I'm thinking like, you know, very like 19th century, like a a pudding called blancmange could be flavored with different things, but that's like a recipe you'd find from like the 1800s. What do you think the first step in that dessert would be? Boiling calves' feet to extract gelatin that you could then use in your dessert. Um, so, modern convenience of being able to buy purified gelatin is is pretty special. But yes, agar has been in use for far longer. Uh, in the grand scheme of things. So let's talk about agar. Seaweed derived. It's texture, very different from gelatin. Again, short textured, very firm and brittle. Whereas um, a gelatin gel is very elastic and stretchy. Um, if you try to stretch a, an agar gel, it'll just crumble into pieces. <clears throat> which is one of the big reasons why when asked, can I substitute agar for gelatin? The answer is usually you can, but you won't get anywhere near the same results. Uh, so short textured, how we work with agar is also quite different from gelatin. It requires heating. Essentially, it requires bringing up to a boil. And then whereas gelatin sets around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, agar will begin to set above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And then it doesn't melt until it hits about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you think about that, one of the first things that comes to mind working with agar in terms of novel ideas, since we usually think of gels set with gelatin as being cold, unless like a gummy bear, you have so much gelatin that it's still solid at, at room temperature. Um, 
if gelatin gels are usually uh, thought of as cold, now you can think about doing gels that are hot. And for some people that just kind of blows their mind. But we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Short textured, high setting point, high melting point, but it is technically thermo reversible. Uh, like high methoxyl pectin, it's also shear thinning. So we're not gonna use agar today to talk about um, a whole interesting category of, I guess you could call them sauces called fluid gels. Uh, we're gonna use um, carrageenan to kind of explore that area. Um, but that's something that's kind of changed my, I'm not gonna say it changed my life. Um, that might be a little too dramatic, but um, being able to create a creamy, thick texture without things like a ton of sugar and butter and egg yolks um, changed my life, certainly, as a, a, in, in terms of some of the components I can incorporate, say, into a plated dessert. But we'll talk about shear thinning a little bit later. What we're going to look at now is an interesting technique where we can create little solid pearls using agar. So I have the recipe in the handout here. We're gonna do a mango passion fruit uh, pearl. These are gonna be solid all the way through. This picture, this is from my Laberna Den days about 2010. <laughs> this was actually created after uh, visiting a cocoa farm for the first time and realizing, oh wait, we're at a cocoa farm, but there's a mango tree and there's a coconut tree and they grow cashews a couple of kilometers down the road. And it's one of those things that's obvious when you think about it, um, but this idea of what grows together goes together. So this was a dessert I created that had chocolate and coconut and mango and cashew and lime, with the mango pearls being um, an element of that. So working with agar, I don't need to dry blend agar, I can just dump it into my water. Water can be hot or cold. Agar is, is actually very versatile. It doesn't really have any sensitivities. Uh, doesn't care what the pH or acidity is. But like almost all hydrocolloids, I'm gonna hydrate this alone in some just straight water, which requires bringing this up to a boil. It's a very small amount here. Once I come up to a boil, I'll just turn it down and just let it simmer for 30 seconds. I always turn it down because I, I don't wanna lose too much water because that can affect um, the final gel or whatever it is I'm making. <laughs> so once I've had a simmer, I add sugar. I'm gonna add my mango and passion fruit. I think in the recipe, I, I say to um, warm this slightly. It can either be warmed or at the very least room temperature. What I don't want is refrigerator temperature fruit puree going into the agar, because like with pectin, that'll drop the temperature drastically. And now that we know that agar will set at temperatures above 100 degrees, <clears throat> if this were to suddenly fall below that setting temperature, it would set up before I could use it. So I just want to whisk that in. It's shear thinning, right? So the more I stir it, shear is just basically force. It could just be stirring, it could be whipping, it could be blending it. Um, the more I stir it, um, I run the risk of thinning it out. So I just want to stir it just so combine. Then I can turn off the heat. I'm gonna transfer it here to a squeeze bottle. And you'll notice other than just adding it at the end where it's getting warm, I didn't really heat the fruit, which again, the idea here is to be flavor forward. And when we heat ingredients like fruit purees, some of the, the subtle volatile flavor compounds that make fresh fruit taste like fresh fruit evaporate away. And then they taste like cooked fruit. I want this to taste as fresh as possible. 
So this is another great reason why working with some of these hydrocolloids can make things flavor forward. So I've got it in a squeeze bottle. I, I made some earlier. And just to show you how quickly this sets, I just poured some into a dish or a little cup and, and it was never chilled. So this is room temperature. It's been at room temperature since I made it. It's very, very stiff. Why don't we pass that around? They can just take a look at it. Don't eat it. In this beaker, I have some just plain vegetable oil. Like cold. So refrigerator temperature, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is what's going to quickly chill little beads of our agar gel. The idea is the cold oil will quickly gel these drops by time they sink to the bottom of the beaker. It uh, has a weird like lava lamp kind of effect. Sometimes when there's condensation, it's hard to see. Can everybody see these little drops falling from where you are? Question. So that's a great question. So what's the minimum distance? To me, this is the minimum. Uh, when I've done this in production, meaning we make a lot, I would just have an eight or 12 quart plastic container of oil that just always lived in the refrigerator. So I had lots of distance for those drops to fall. This is hot. This is cold. When I'm adding this hot liquid, it's the oil is slowly getting warmer. Whoop. And I want to maintain the temperature of the oil because if, if, these, if these pearls don't set on their way down, they basically just form a big disc at the bottom instead of individual pearls. So the volume is important. I want the oil to stay cold throughout the process. And that distance is, is helpful. For demonstration purposes, this is fine. I'm not gonna do this whole bottle. Although by the time we finish the demo and I go back to the chocolate lab, this will solidify completely. So I'm gonna have fun cleaning this out later. Pro tip, always rinse out the bottle immediately when you're done. It'll save you some hassle. This is a sweet application, but this could be basically done with anything. Only thing that I've sometimes had some issues with is if I'm doing something that has a, a fat content. So I had a dessert many, many years ago where I was making sweet potato pearls. And basically when I first started doing it, I was making a sweet potato custard. So sweet potato blended with some milk and cream. And because of the fat in the dairy, slightly less dense than the oil it's floating in. So they would always just float at the top and I would have to stir it to get them to sink. Um, so after that, I just did sweet potato puree uh, without the dairy. Uh, but that's really the only, only issue I've ever had with it. One thing I forgot to mention, you'll see in the recipe, not only is there agar, but there's also another gelling agent, locust bean gum. It's not absolutely necessary, but because agar sets so firm and brittle, um, in this case, we get this, what's called synergy. So synergy is where you have two things working together that create something different than the sum of their parts. The locust bean gum actually softens the agar gel ever so slightly. So it's got a, just a little bit more pleasant texture um, when you're eating them. But I typically will just let these sit in the oil, maybe put it back in the fridge for five or 10 minutes, then drain it out. And I have some for you that I made earlier. I'm using a, a neutral oil. 
This is actually kind of like a canola oil. I would prefer ideally to use something with absolutely no flavor whatsoever, something like a grapeseed oil. Um, or, I mean, maybe it would be interesting to incorporate the flavor of the oil if you wanted that flavor. If I wanted the flavor of olive oil, that would be cool. I could use olive oil. Although olive oil typically at this temperature solidifies a little bit, so that'd be a, a, a problem. But maybe sesame oil could be interesting. Because typically I don't rinse them. I like the little bit of like slipperiness and shine that I get when I don't rinse. Do you see here, my oil was cold. So by the time these droplets hit the bottom, they, they remain separate. And I'll usually just drain them. Sometimes I'll, I'll blot them with some paper towel in the container they're sitting. But I, I find agar to be one of the more versatile uh, hydrocolloids. So I, I use it for all kinds of different applications, not just making pearls like this. Here we have synergy with gelatin. So this is like a film or a veil um, made with strawberry water that's sitting over a, a yogurt panna cotta. Here, what I'm doing is I'm taking strawberry water. In this case, I'm taking like mashed strawberries with some sugar and some acid and letting it hang. So I get this really intense, but clear strawberry liquid. Hydrating the agar into it, then adding some gelatin to dissolve and then pouring it out onto, I usually use like a plastic tray like this with some either a plastic wrap or acetate. And because it's agar, it'll set within about two minutes. And you get the, the firmness of the agar, but the gelatin gives you the flexibility and the, <clears throat> it's just that synergy of it's greater than the sum of its parts. A really cool uh, component to, to play with. And often it's kind of trans, transparent or translucent, uh, but can have a cool effect on a dessert. As I mentioned, uh, hot applications, this was from a long time ago. Uh, this was a corn creme brulee. So I made a corn custard. I mean, technically it didn't even have to be a custard. It had a little bit of egg yolk in it. The egg yolk was doing nothing to give it texture. It was there to remind you that it's a custard, a little bit of egginess. Um, and I set it into tubes. And then because it's agar, it's heat stable to some degree. So I could sprinkle it with sugar and caramelize it with the blowtorch. Also taking advantage of the heat um, stability is using agar to stabilize hot foams. Um, usually a hot foam will collapse as soon as it's dispensed, if there's nothing there to give it body. Uh, so this was a, a pea puree that I stabilized with agar, blended it, and was able to do um, a hot English pea foam in an eggshell. And then this was like a, what was this? Sweetbreads and like a, a low temperature poached egg, um, mushrooms, but it was all kind of in that pea foam uh, in a different vessel. We'll talk about um, shear thinning later. Another thing I didn't add a slide for is another cool technique that you don't see too much um, is clarification. Um, old school clarification, like making a consomme, you have a stock and then you make a mixture called a raft that's like raw egg whites and mirepoix and maybe some ground meat and you mix it in your stock and you gently simmer it and what happens, it all roots, uh, floats to the top. And with it, it takes out all the, the cloudy impurities of that stock, so you have a crystal clear consomme. What makes that work is all that protein, the ground meat, the egg whites, et cetera. Um, so you can actually clarify with gelatin, but it's actually, you get a, a, a more efficient clarification by using agar. So basically you make, um, I've done this a lot when I do my hydrocolloids class, the long form, uh, where I take a cucumber juice that's kind of cloudy, and I set a very weak agar gel 
and then just kind of break it up and let it sit in cheesecloth. And after a few hours, I get like a really intensely flavored cucumber juice that's as clear as water. So another cool technique that we can utilize with agar. Moving on to xanthan gum. This is the one, remember I said, probably the most user-friendly of hydrocolloids. Maybe the scariest to a lot of people because as an X in it, they don't know how to pronounce it, right? They see it on a, on a label. They're like, ooh. Um, it's made from a bacterial process. So very benign. Um, I don't know if that's technically plant-based if it involves live bacteria, but why not? Um, also, very few sensitivities. Um, you can just, and I, sometimes I do this at home when I'm cooking, and I just want to thicken a sauce like instantly. I'll literally just take a spoon and just kind of sprinkle it into my sauce. Um, sometimes it'll clump up. It takes some time um, to hydrate, but it works. It's instant. Um, the first time I ever encountered it, I was a young cook more years ago than I cared to share. Um, and um, we're trying to remember the exact situation. Um, but I was working in this like catering kitchen and we were making coleslaw and there was a little packet that we were supposed to use that had salt and some sugar and some xanthan gum in it. And that was kind of like our mixture to mix with the coleslaw with other things. And you have the salt and the sugar, which what they draw moisture out of the cabbage or whatever the vegetables you're using. And the xanthan gum, as that moisture was being pulled out, thickened it so it wasn't watery and kind of made a creamy dressing for the coleslaw. That was my first sort of like introduction to xanthan gum many, many, many years ago in a not very fine dining environment. Um, like I said, you can just stir it in, but typically I'll like to use a blender or an immersion blender at the very least, shearing in will help disperse it uh, more quickly. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can literally add it to any liquid and it'll thicken. Um, I'm gonna show you an application that again, kind of shows us how it works with some other ingredients. This is the bergamot meringue. Is everyone familiar with bergamot? Where do you most often see bergamot as a flavor. Earl Grey tea, it's that citrus note in Earl Grey tea. Um, that's usually incorporated as an oil or the peel, but it actually has a, a really delicious juice as well. Super acidic. Alex is gonna pass around a, a container of a, of a frozen version of a bergamot puree. So what I did previously is just with an immersion blender, I blended some water, some of the bergamot puree, some sugar, some xanthan gum, and then a soy protein called Versa Whip. It's a brand name. But it's modified soy protein to kind of mimic the protein in an egg white. So what I can do is I can make an eggless meringue. How does a, mer a typical meringue work? We have, in an egg white, we have protein and water. That's pretty much it, 15% protein, the rest is water. And the protein as, well, the, the, the viscosity of the egg white, as it whips, it's trapping air. And as it's also whipping, the proteins kind of unfurl and stabilize that foam. That's the very short version of what a meringue is. Here I'm replicating that with the soy protein. And then the Versa Whip is simply adding body and viscosity to make it thick and trap air as it's whipping. It's still got a little bit of a foamy head just from where I blended it. But all I have to do is, I usually let this sit for a couple hours just to fully hydrate. And then I can throw it into a mixer just like a standard meringue. Again, thinking about being flavor forward. <laughs> if I ask myself, how, do I, how would I make a flavored meringue? Well, certainly I can buy pure egg white protein, egg white powder. 
but I remember to height to, to, to kind of get the same amount of protein that an actual egg white would have, I would have to use about 15% egg white powder to 85% water to replicate the composition of a fresh egg white. Here, I'm using a fraction of that percentage of this soy-based protein. So again, I get a more flavor forward end result. I tend to use this mostly for very intense acidic flavors. because they cut, tend to come through very nicely. So this has been whipping maybe for about two minutes now. You can see we're not quite at stiff peaks yet, but a couple more minutes of, of whipping and we'll get there. We're also going to use xanthan for another foam uh, using another hydrocolloid here in a few more minutes. Can I over whip it? I never have. And it's also cool because it'll break down eventually. You can re whip it, not a problem. The next day, the one thing I've never played with too much is using it in place of egg whites to say leaven a cake or a souffle. Um, I've heard mixed results from other people, but in theory, I could use it to make like a eggless souffle. Might not be super stable, but. Pretty stiff. This is great with, like I said, other very acidic fruit juices, yuzu, lemon, passion fruit, calamansi. Give you some of this to taste. Then we're going to move on to. Alginate. Bergamot meringue. The quote the air quotes are important, right? I don't have a blowtorch handy, uh, but I think we did play around with that years ago. And again, it kind of deflates it a little bit, um, but something worth exploring. And I'm going to try to remember to play with that in the near future. So let's move on to alginate. Also from seaweed or algae. This is probably uh, the, I guess, the weirdest one, the one that when you're introduced to it, it doesn't work how you think gelling agents typically work. From a, a species of brown algae, it's not thermoreversible. In fact, it doesn't really melt at all. If it does have a melting temperature, it's very high. one primary sensitivity is low pH or high acidity. So you'll have problems trying to form a gel um, or working with alginate in general with something below 3.0, which is usually mostly citrus fruits 
and intense tropical fruits like passion fruit will fall below that, that pH level, but virtually everything else um, it's pretty friendly with. So what makes it interesting is it spontaneously forms a gel in the presence of calcium. But we'll get to that in a minute. How do I work with it? Just to kind of demonstrate how I would tend to disperse or hydrate most, most of these types of hydrocolloids in a blender. It's creating shear, right? It's going to help disperse things. Forget how this works. There we go. What I'll do is I'll kind of get the water going and I want the, the speed high enough so I get that little vortex in the center. And then I just stream the xanthin, the alginate, whatever it is, into that vortex. Maybe increase the speed a little bit. And that will disperse it and, and get it to hydrate properly without it forming lumps. For alginate in particular, it's actually helpful if the water is on the warm side, hot tap water. Although it sets, uh, forms a gel in the presence of calcium. Uh, if you, New York water is okay, uh, but in some places the water has a lot of minerals in it. So it can actually affect um, how the alginate works and just the water alone. Um, you'll see another in the recipe for the alginate bath, you'll see another ingredient called sodium citrate. Um, there's another ingredient that works in a similar way. It's a fun one to say, sodium hexametaphosphate. Um, not to get into the science of, of it too deeply, but one of either of those ingredients will act as a buffer to allow you to work with either hard water, but it can also be a little bit more tolerant of lower pH. So I almost always add the sodium citrate in there just as a default, although it's not absolutely necessary. You'll see it's cloudy. That's because I just blended a bunch of air into it. It does give it a little bit of viscosity. It, it coats the inside of that blender. But if I just let this sit overnight, all that air will dissipate. You can even put it in, inside of a, a vacuum chamber and suck, suck the air bubbles out. But I have some already set up here and flat tray. Room temperature actually works even better if it's slightly warmer than room temperature. In a production setting, I would make large quantities of this, store it in the refrigerator, but then bring it out a couple hours to come to room temperature or just warm it up. And today I wanted to do a couple more savory things. So what I've done is I've taken some goat cheese and just thinned it out. So it was a little, you know, semi-liquid, thinning it out with some whole milk, seasoning it with a little bit of salt. And although there is some natural calcium obviously present in the milk and the cheese, I added calcium in a purified form. There's lots of different calcium forms. Can I get the, the spheres from the freezer? If you're eating something like a energy bar or a beverage of some kind that is enriched with calcium, this is the type of ingredient that they're using. Uh, calcium lactate is the one I typically use the most. It's got a high calcium content, but it's also fairly soluble. It's, it's easily dissolved. So it's, it's, for me, it's easy to work with. Plus it doesn't have a taste of any kind. So I just mix that in with the, the goat cheese in the milk. You can just drop it into the alginate I think I have a couple slides out of order, but I, I could simply drop that in uh, with a spoon. 
Um, but I'd like consistent size and shape. So I took that goat cheese mixture, put it in a silicone mold. So I have consistent size and shape here, froze it so I could get it out of the molds. And now I'm just going to drop it into this bath. So what's happening? There's calcium in this, right? So as this is thawing in the alginate bath, which is slightly warm or at least room temperature, as it's thawing out, it's exposing calcium to this bath, which has the alginate in it. So the bath itself is forming a skin around the goat cheese. There's nothing in the goat cheese that's actually changing at all. It's just providing a vehicle of calcium to form a gel at the surface where it's coming into contact with the bath. So I'm going to maintain a liquid center as opposed to the mango, which was uh, solid. So we call this reverse spherification, which implies that there's a, what's the opposite of reverse, a forward fermentation or a spherification. Um, when people first started doing this, again, about 25 years ago, they were actually putting the calcium in the bath and putting the alginate in whatever was being spherified. Two problems with that. The, the, the calcium source most often used was calcium chloride, which does not taste great. And sodium alginate, once it starts to gel, it just continues to gel. So that, er, those, that early spherification technique, once these sat for a while, they would solidify completely. Um, so somebody came up with this idea. I don't know who exactly. Uh, and it makes it very easy. And even from a, like a production standpoint, it's very fast. I have, I have these frozen ahead of time. I pop them out. I put them in uh, the bath. It takes maybe three or four minutes. What I'm doing is I'm moving them around so they don't stick because they will fuse together. Um, and then I'm also just keeping them suspended so they don't stick to the bottom. But in this case, there's a lot of fat in there. So they're floating at the top. So if anything, I'm trying to kind of base them a little bit. I'm going to have you help me out. So I want to maybe not get too much of the cream. Just the spirit time. Yeah. So Alex is going to start to plate some that I did earlier. Once these have had a few minutes for the skin to form around them. I'm just going to give them a rinse. Just in some water. And this alginate bath can be used over and over and over again. I have seen it, I don't know. I mean, I guess the, the alginate can <clears throat> provide something interesting to molds if it sits for like weeks at a time. So I just keep it chilled but it can't really go bad. It's just water. It's just thickened water. So I'll let these take a rinse. And then you do need to store them in some liquid. If I just put them in some sort of container by themselves, they would probably burst and puncture each other. So when I'm doing a sweet application, I will put them in a, a simple syrup. Actually, not a simple syrup. Slightly weaker than simple syrup. Um, because what's interesting is that that film is permeable. So the syrup can actually pull moisture out from the inside. 
So when they sit in a stronger syrup for a while, they actually get smaller and a little bit more spherical, which can be interesting. Um, but what's also fun is taking advantage of that permeability, um, I can carbonate the inside. So I wouldn't do it with goat cheese, but I could take like a strawberry sphere, put it in a foam canister, seal it, add CO2. I'm not shaking it up. I'm just adding it and then letting it sit for a while. And then when I release the gas, I have like a strawberry soda in a little sphere form. Sounds complicated, but it's actually quite simple. Yeah, I would say as long as you have enough for everybody to have one. So what I did is um, just to hold these, I have them in some, just a little bit of heavy cream. I guess if I had goat's milk, that, that would have been appropriate too. But because uh, Alginet has a very, very high, if an existing melting point, I could serve these hot. I could float these in a soup, which would be kind of cool, right? Imagine like a French onion soup with like warm spheres of like liquid Gruyere floating. That could be kind of cool. Let's move on. Is it okay if I go about five minutes over? My slides are a little out of order. We talked about hydrolyzed soy protein. This is what I was talking about. You, you can use a spoon to just drop a spherified liquid in, but they typically are more bean shaped. And if I were to do that, I would use like a, a measuring spoon that has a very deep sort of spherical shape. A couple examples of where I've used it. This is a pear sphere with like a vanilla cream, chestnut, mango with pistachio, raspberry, rose. I'm gonna fast forward here to get to carrageenan. Another one that I think people are scared of because they don't know how to pronounce it. Also co <clears throat> comes from algae or seaweed sources. There are three types. Iota, Lambda, Kappa. We're gonna be looking at Kappa. It has similar properties to um, agar. What makes it a little different from agar is that it actually is very friendly with um, dairy products and milk proteins. So it's often used to stabilize yogurt drinks and things like that. What I've done is I've made an infusion with popcorn. Like what I'm going after here is like cheap fake butter flavor. I'm trying to go after that like nostalgia that we can all relate to. So I just go to the store, I buy whatever the extra butter microwave popcorn. Then I infuse this in milk and cream for several hours. When I strain that out, I get this wonderful popcorn infusion. And again, what's really important, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, it's all of the yellow stuff floating on the top that like fake butter oil. I mean, I think it's real, but processed in some form. That's what's gonna give us our buttered popcorn flavor. I take that infusion of milk and cream. If you look at the recipe, you'll see that the, the total liquid adds up to about 600 grams. Um, but the recipe to make the gel with the, the carrageenan um, only calls for 500 grams. That's because that popcorn is gonna absorb a lot of moisture. So I need to kind of overcompensate for that because I'm gonna lose some moisture just by straining it, even if I press on it as hard as I can. Very, very similar to agar. I add carrageenan, a little bit of sugar, um, a little bit of salt, although you have to be careful because you're also gonna be kind of leaching the salt that's on the popcorn um, into that infusion. Bring it up to a boil, pour it into a pan like this. And what I get, 
is a firm, brittle gel. Alex, can I get a quick rinse on this? So here's where we're gonna talk about shear thinning. So I mentioned at the beginning, rheology is a really interesting branch of physics that studies how liquids behave under different circumstances. And we call water a Newtonian, after Isaac Newton, a Newtonian fluid. Um, and we all know how water behaves. We apply some sort of force and the water reacts and then we remove the force and it comes back like waves. Um, but not all liquids behave like Newtonian liquids. Some are sheer thickening where you apply some sort of force and the liquid gets thicker. A super simple example of that is whipped cream. We take cream, we apply sheer, meaning we whip it. It gets thicker. We're going to be looking at shear thinning properties. When I'm making pot de fouille, I'm trying to avoid it. Here, I'm exploiting it. So I'm going to take my gel. This has just been sitting at room temperature. If I were to have chilled it, when I blend it, because it's got so much milk fat, it might break. So I either blend it at room temperature or I actually warm it up ever so slightly. My goal here is to create a texture that's very much like a pastry cream. Nice, thick, creamy. What does it take to make a pastry cream? A lot of egg yolks, which obscures flavor. Starch, which is a great thickener, but obscures flavor. And typically a pastry cream also, um, I mean, it's, it's sweet, so it's gonna have some sugar, but it requires a certain amount of sugar in order to also use egg yolks. So, in a search for how can I get that same texture, but being more flavor forward, this is the result. Sometimes it takes, it's so thick, it takes a, a few minutes to really get in there. And now because it has milk fat in it, it will thicken up if I chill it. But now I have this like really beautiful, like thick, creamy texture. I can control the sugar. There's minimal sugar here. If anything, this is kind of like a weird, sweet, savory kind of gray area, the way I made it today but I don't have that also that cream that tastes like starch and, and egg yolk. So I've used this in a few different applications. One was as the filling for a, a shoe puff. But one of my favorite things, like there was also kind of a trend for a while. I mean, as, as, a, as a pastry chef, I deeply, think about like the opportunity to play with nostalgia, but like in a subconscious way, you know, for a while, pastry chefs would put pop rocks on a dessert to be nostalgic. I'm like, okay, that's kind of beating somebody over the head with the idea or putting caramel popcorn on a dessert. This is a more refined way to kind of get that idea across. So I'll give you a taste of this. little lump that didn't blend up.
But the same idea, you know, thinking about something like lemon curd. How do we make lemon curd? Lemon juice, lots of whole egg, lots of sugar, lots of butter. And then we also essentially boil that lemon juice. But I could make a lemon fluid gel, probably with agar in that case, where I can control the sugar. I can make the sugar whatever I want it to be. And I get a texture that's very similar, but it's, it's a very, very different expression of lemon. And you know, believe me, I love lemon curd. And I've, I've put those two components side by side on the same dessert just to give you those two different expressions. All right, last thing. This is kind of an oddball in uh, hydrocolloid world. Methyl cellulose, also very scary sounding. Also plant-based. It's actually made from plant fiber. This is kind of infamous for being able to create hot gels, but not in the sense that agar does or, you know, um, thermal stability like alginate has. This will form a gel when it's hot. And then when it cools down, it liquefies. So it's like the opposite of gelatin. And I've seen some like really cool, interesting things done with it. Um, and for a while, there was a, a, a friend of mine who was playing around with the idea of hot ice cream. It's like, well, if it's hot, it's not ice cream, but it, like kind of, kind of an interesting idea. Um, what I did for you today, just to wrap up, is take some beet juice. And this could be like juice raw beets, or you could blend cooked beets with some water and just let it hang for a while. Um, not as intense that way combining it with some sugar, bring it to a simmer to essentially um, dissolve that sugar. In the blender, adding some xanthan gum to provide some viscosity and some methyl cellulose. And it'll, it'll thicken up on its own. So it's fairly viscous. And then just like the bergamot meringue, I can throw this into the mixer. This takes a few minutes. But once I get a really thick, stiff peak, then I pipe it. into little mounds. So I could make like, kind of like the picture implies like a little, almost like a little macaroon type sandwich. I've also, what I've done with this is I've hollowed out the inside and piped something else in there. Could be like a goat cheese cream or could be sweet or savory. So these have, been, these have been in the hydrator for only about four hours. They're kind of crispy on the outside, soft in the middle. But we could take them all the way crispy. This is also something where we could kind of blur the lines between sweet and savory. So there's both a little sugar in here, but also some salt. So as that continues to whip, like if I gave it a few more minutes, it'd be stiff peaks like the, the bergamot was. So hopefully that gave us a good look at both some classic 
ideas as well as some novel ideas. Um, and of course I could do 90 minutes on each one of these alone, uh, but hopefully that gave you a, a good broad overview to then kind of explore further on your own. Uh, and that's all I've got for you. Any other questions that I can answer for you? Maybe this is like hot off the press. So this is something I just started working on a few weeks ago. Um, I don't know what to call it. So far, I've just been calling it some kind of fruit roll up, um, but it's kind of a, a mixture of some of these techniques. So the, the orange layer is a mango and Thai basil pot de fouille. So when I make the pot de fouille, I pour it out into a thin sheet or I pour it into a block and cut little thin strips of it. And then the same with a marshmallow. This is a hibiscus marshmallow. So in place of water and the, the syrup for the marshmallow, I'm um, using a hibiscus infusion. So it gives it, even in the one that's whipped, it has a slight little pinkish purplish color. And then just kind of roll it up with some little Thai basil. Any questions? Say that again. Yeah. You, yeah, it's probably more of a chemistry experiment than most home kitchens are set up for. Um, I've also done a lot of research lately into um, prickly pear or cactus pear and not the fruit itself, but the pads like nopales. You know how they're kind of sticky and they actually call that stickiness a, a mucus. People are starting to play with food applications for the natural hydrocolloids in the cactus pad, but it's so new, nobody is making it commercially. But I, I wanna, for another completely different reason, I wanna like play with it uh, so I can make like a prickly pear foam stabilized with prickly pear hydrocolloids, um, but you can't even buy it anywhere. And I, I do have like the recipe for it, but I would need a chemistry lab to make it. I mean, do they give, do they give their own flavor? I mean, that's interesting. I've, I've had some people say like, oh yeah, I don't like xanthan because I can taste it. I mean, often with something like gelatin, like you're using too much if you can taste it. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Chef? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think some of it is just some bias too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anything used in moderation, I think is, is great, but everything can also be abused and misused for sure. Cool. Well, thanks for coming, guys.